So, if doing the most important thing is the most important thing, why would you try to do anything else at the same time? It's a great question. In the summer of 2009, Clifford Nass set out to answer just that. His mission? To find out how well so-called multitaskers multitasked. Nass, a professor at Stanford University, told the New York Times that he had been in awe of multitaskers and deemed himself to be a poor one. So he and his team of researchers gave 262 students questionnaires to determine how often they multitasked. They divided their test subjects into two groups of high and low multitaskers and began with the presumption that the frequent multitaskers would perform better. They were wrong. I was sure they had some secret ability, said Nass, but it turns out that high multitaskers are suckers for irrelevancy. They were outperformed on every measure. Although they'd convinced themselves and the world they were great at it, there was just one problem. To quote Nass, multitaskers were just lousy at everything. Multitasking is a lie. It's a lie because nearly everyone accepts it as an effective thing to do. It's become so mainstream that people actually think it's something they should do and do as often as possible. We not only hear talk about doing it, we even hear talk about getting better at it. More than six million web pages offer answers on how to do it, and career websites list multitasking as a skill for employers to target and for prospective hires to list as a strength. Some have gone so far as to be proud of their supposed skill at it and have adopted it as a way of life. But it's actually a way of lie. For the truth is, multitasking is neither efficient nor effective. In the world of results, it will fail you every time. As Steve Uzel said, multitasking is merely the opportunity to screw up more than one thing at a time. When you try to do two things at once, you either can't or won't do either well. If you think multitasking is an effective way to get more done, you've got it backwards. It's an effective way to get less done. Monkey Mind The concept of humans doing more than one thing at a time has been studied by psychologists since the 1920s. But the term multitasking didn't arrive on the scene until the 1960s. It was used to describe computers, not people. Back then, 10 megahertz was apparently so mind-bogglingly fast that a whole new word was needed to describe a computer's ability to quickly perform many tasks. In retrospect, they probably made a poor choice, for the expression multitasking is inherently deceptive. Multitasking is about multiple tasks alternately sharing one resource, the CPU. But in time, the context was flipped and it became interpreted to mean multiple tasks being done simultaneously by one resource, that is, a person. It was a clever turn of phrase that's misleading, for even computers can process only one piece of code at a time. When they multitask, they switch back and forth, alternating their attention until both tasks are done. The speed with which computers tackle multiple tasks feeds the illusion that everything happens at the same time, so comparing computers to humans can be confusing. People can actually do two or more things at once, such as walk and talk or chew gum and read a map. But like computers, what we can't do is focus on two things at once. Our attention bounces back and forth. This is fine for computers, but it has serious repercussions in humans. Two airliners are cleared to land on the same runway. A patient is given the wrong medicine. A toddler is left unattended in the bathtub. What all these potential tragedies share is that people are trying to do too many things at once and forget to do something they should do. It's strange, but somehow, over time, the image of the modern human has become one of a multitasker. We think we can, so we think we should. Kids studying while texting, listening to music, or watching television. Adults driving while talking on the phone, eating, applying makeup, or even shaving. Doing something in one room while talking to someone in the next. Smartphones in hands before napkins hit laps. 
It's not that we have too little time to do all the things we need to do. It's that we feel the need to do too many things in the time we have. So we double and triple up in the hope of getting everything done. And then there's work. The modern office is a carnival of distracting, multitasking demands. While you diligently try to complete a project, someone has a coughing fit in a nearby cubicle and asks if you have a lozenge. The office paging system continually calls out messages that anyone within earshot of an intercom hears. You're alerted around the clock to new emails arriving in your inbox, while your social media news feed keeps trying to catch your eye, and your cell phone intermittently vibrates on the desk to the tune of a new text. A stack of unopened mail and piles of unfinished work sit within sight as people keep swinging by your desk all day to ask you questions. Distraction, disturbance, disruption. Staying on task is exhausting. Researchers estimate that workers are interrupted every 11 minutes and then spend almost a third of their day recovering from these distractions. And yet amid all of this, we still assume we can rise above it and do what has to be done within our deadlines. When you get the one thing, you begin to see the business world differently. If today your company doesn't know what its one thing is, then the company's one thing is to find out. One person. Ross Garber said, there can only be one most important thing. Many things may be important, but only one can be the most important. The one thing is a dominant theme that shows up in different ways. Take the concept and apply it to people and you'll see where one person makes all the difference. As a freshman in high school, Walt Disney took night courses at the Chicago Art Institute and became the cartoonist for his school newspaper. After graduation, he wanted to be a newspaper cartoonist but couldn't get a job. So his brother Roy, a businessman and banker, got him work at an art studio. It was there he learned animation and began creating animated cartoons. When Walt was young, his one person was Roy. For Sam Walton early on, it was L.S. Robson, his father-in-law, who loaned him the $20,000 he needed to start his first retail business, a Ben Franklin franchise store. Then, when Sam was opening his first Walmart, Robson secretly paid a landlord $20,000 to provide a pivotal expansion lease. Albert Einstein had Max Talmud, his first mentor. It was Max who introduced a 10-year-old Einstein to key texts in math, science, and philosophy. Max took one meal a week with the Einstein family for six years while guiding young Albert. No one is self-made. Oprah Winfrey credits her father and the time she spent with him and his wife for saving her. She told Jill Nelson of the Washington Post magazine, if I hadn't been sent to my father, I would have gone in another direction. Professionally, it started with Jeffrey D. Jacobs, the lawyer, agent, manager, and financial advisor, who, when Oprah was looking for employment contract advice, persuaded her to establish her own company rather than simply be a talent for hire. Harpo Productions, Inc. was born. The world is familiar with the influence that John Lennon and Paul McCartney had on each other's songwriting success, but in the recording studio, there was George Martin. Considered one of the greatest record producers of all time, George has often been referred to as the fifth Beatle for his extensive involvement on the Beatles' original albums. Martin's musical expertise helped fill the gaps between the Beatles' raw talent and the sound they wanted to achieve. Most of the Beatles' orchestral arrangements and instrumentation, as well as numerous keyboard parts on the early records, were written or performed by Martin in collaboration with the band. Everyone has one person who either means the most to them or was the first to influence, train, or manage them. No one succeeds alone. No one. One passion, one skill. General George S. Patton said, you must be single-minded. Drive for the one thing on which you have decided. 
Look behind any story of extraordinary success and the one thing is always there. It shows up in the life of any successful business and in the professional life of anyone successful. It also shows up around personal passions and skills. We each have passions and skills, but you'll see extraordinarily successful people with one intense emotion or one learned ability that shines through, defining them or driving them more than anything else. Often the line between passion and skill can be blurry. That's because they're almost always connected. Pat Matthews, one of America's great Impressionist painters, says he turned his passion for painting into a skill and ultimately a profession by simply painting one painting a day. Angelo Amarico, Italy's most successful tour guide, says he developed his skills and ultimately his business from his singular passion for his country and the deep desire to share it with others. This is the storyline for extraordinary success stories. Passion for something leads to disproportionate time practicing or working at it. That time spent eventually translates to skill. And when skill improves, results improve. Better results generally lead to more enjoyment and more passion and more time is invested. It can be a virtuous cycle all the way to extraordinary results. Vince Lombardi said, success demands singleness of purpose. Gilbert Tuabunye's one passion is running. Gilbert is an American long distance runner born in Sunga, Burundi, whose early love of track and field helped him win the Burundi National Championship in the men's 400 and 800 meters while only a junior in high school. This passion helped save his life. On October 21, 1993, members of the Hutu tribe invaded Gilbert's high school and captured the students of the Tutsi tribe. Those not immediately killed were beaten and burned alive in a nearby building. After nine hours buried beneath burning bodies, Gilbert managed to escape and outrun his captors to the safety of a nearby hospital. He was the lone survivor. He came to Texas and kept competing, honing his skills. Recruited by Abilene Christian University, Gilbert earned All-America honors six times. After graduation, he moved to Austin, where by all accounts he is the most popular running coach in the city. To drill for water in Burundi, he co-founded the Gazelle Foundation, whose main fundraiser is, wait for it, Run for the Water, a sponsored run through the streets of Austin. Do you see the theme running through his life? From competitor to survivor, from college to career to charity, Gilbert Tuabunye's passion for running became a skill that led to a profession that opened up an opportunity to give back. The smile he greets fellow runners with on the trails around Austin's Lady Bird Lake symbolizes how one passion can become one skill and together ignite and define an extraordinary life. The one thing shows up time and again in the lives of the successful because it's a fundamental truth. It showed up for me, and if you let it, it will show up for you. Applying the one thing to your work and in your life is the simplest and smartest thing you can do to propel yourself toward the success you want. One Life If I had to choose only one example of someone who has harnessed the one thing to build an extraordinary life, it would be American businessman Bill Gates. Bill's one passion in high school was computers, which led him to develop one skill, computer programming. While in high school, he met one person, Paul Allen, who gave him his first job and became his partner in forming Microsoft. A pioneer of quality control management, Urin noticed that a handful of flaws would usually produce a majority of the defects. This imbalance not only rang true to his experience, but he suspected it might even be a universal law. And what Pareto had observed might be bigger than even Pareto had imagined. While writing his seminal book named Quality Control Handbook, 
Urine wanted to give a short name to the concept of the vital few and trivial many. One of the many illustrations in his manuscript was labeled Pareto's Principle of Unequal Distribution, where another might have called it Urine's Rule, he called it Pareto's Principle. Pareto's Principle, it turns out, is as real as the law of gravity, and yet most people fail to see the gravity of it. It's not just a theory. It is a provable, predictable certainty of nature and one of the greatest productivity truths ever discovered. Richard Koch, in his book The 80-20 Principle, defined it about as well as anyone. Koch says, The 80-20 Principle asserts that a minority of causes, inputs, or effort usually lead to a majority of the results, outputs, or rewards. In other words, in the world of success, things aren't equal. A small amount of causes creates most of the results. Just the right input creates most of the output. Selected effort creates almost all of the rewards. Pareto points us in a very clear direction. The majority of what you want will come from the minority of what you do. Extraordinary results are disproportionately created by fewer actions than most realize. Don't get hung up on the numbers. Pareto's truth is about inequality. And though often stated as an 80-20 ratio, it can actually take a variety of proportions. Depending on the circumstances, it can easily play out as, say, 90-20, where 90% 90 of your success comes from 20% of your effort, or 70-10, or 65-5. But understand that these are all fundamentally working off the same principle. Urine's great insight was that not everything matters equally. Some things matter more than others, a lot more. A to-do list becomes a success list when you apply Pareto's principle to it. The 80-20 principle has been one of the most important guiding success rules in my career. It describes the phenomenon which, like urine, I've observed in my own life over and over again. A few ideas gave me most of my results. Some clients were far more valuable than others. A small number of people created most of my business success. And a handful of investments put the most money in my pocket. Everywhere I turned, the concept of unequal distribution popped up. The more it showed up, the more I paid attention. And the more I paid attention, the more it showed up. Finally, I quit thinking it was a coincidence and began to apply it as the absolute principle of success that it is. Not only to my life, but also in working with everyone else as well. And the results were extraordinary. Extreme Pareto Pareto proves everything I'm telling you, but there's a catch. He doesn't go far enough. I want you to go further. I want you to take Pareto's principle to an extreme. I want you to go small by identifying the 20%. And then I want you to go even smaller by finding the vital few of the vital few. The 80-20 rule is the first word, but not the last, about success. What Pareto started, you've got to finish. Success requires that you follow the 80-20 principle, but you don't have to stop there. Keep going. You can actually take the 20% of the 20% of the 20% and continue until you get to the single most important thing. Figure 5 found online at theonething.com shows you that no matter how many to-dos you start with, you can always narrow it down to one, no matter the task, mission, or goal, big or small, Start with as large a list as you want, but develop the mindset that you will whittle your way from there to the critical few, and not stop until you end with the essential one. The imperative one. The one thing. In 2001, I called a meeting of our key executive team. As fast as we were growing, we were still not acknowledged by the very top people in our industry. I challenged our group to brainstorm 100 ways to turn this situation around. It took us all day to come up with the list. The next morning, we narrowed the list down to 10 ideas. And from there, we chose just one big idea. 
The one that we decided on was that I would write a book on how to become an elite performer in our industry. It worked. Eight years later, that one book had not only become a national bestseller, but also had morphed into a series of books with total sales of over a million copies. In an industry of about a million people, one thing changed our image forever. Now, again, stop and do the math. One idea out of 100. That is Pareto to the extreme. That's thinking big, but going very small. That's applying the one thing to a business challenge in a truly powerful way. But this doesn't just apply to business. On my 40th birthday, I started taking guitar lessons and quickly discovered I could give only 20 minutes a day to practice. This wasn't much, so I knew I had to narrow down what I learned. I asked my friend Eric Johnson, who happens to be one of the greatest guitarists ever, for advice. Eric said that if I could do only one thing, then I should practice my scales. So I took his advice and chose the minor blues scale. What I discovered was that if I learned that scale, then I could play many of the solos of great classic rock guitarists, from Eric Clapton to Billy Gibbons and maybe someday even Eric Johnson. That scale became my one thing for the guitar, and it unlocked the world of rock and roll for me. The inequality of effort for results is everywhere in your life if you will simply look for it. And if you apply this principle, it will unlock the success you seek in anything that matters to you. There will always be just a few things that matter more than the rest. And out of those, one will matter most. Internalizing this concept is like being handed a magic compass. Whenever you feel lost or lacking direction, you can pull it out to remind yourself to discover what matters most. Big Ideas Go small. Don't focus on being busy. Focus on being productive. Allow what matters most to drive your day. Go extreme. Once you've figured out what actually matters, keep asking what matters most until there is only one thing left. That core activity goes at the top of your success list. Say no, whether you say later or never. The point is to say not now to anything else you could do until your most important work is done. Don't get trapped in the checkoff game. If we believe things don't matter equally, we must act accordingly. We can't fall prey to the notion that everything has to be done, that checking things off our list is what success is all about. We can't be trapped in a game of checkoff that never produces a winner. The truth is that things don't matter equally, and success is found in doing what matters most. Sometimes it's the first thing you do. Sometimes it's the only thing you do. Regardless, doing the most important thing is always the most important thing. In Leeuwarden, the Netherlands, on Domino Day, November 13, 2009, Weiger's Domino Productions coordinated the world record domino fall by lining up more than 4,491,863 dominoes in a dazzling display. In this instance, a single domino set in motion a domino fall that cumulatively unleashed more than 94,000 joules of energy which is as much energy as it takes for an average-sized male to do 545 push-ups. Each standing domino represents a small amount of potential energy. The more you line up, the more potential energy you've accumulated. Line up enough, and with a simple flick, you can start a chain reaction of surprising power. And Weiger's Domino Productions proved it. When one thing the right thing is set in motion, it can topple many things. And that's not all. In 1983, Lauren Whitehead wrote in the American Journal of Physics that he discovered domino falls could not only topple many things, they could also topple bigger things. He described how a single domino is capable of bringing down another domino that is actually 50% larger. Do you see the implication? 
Not only can one knock over others, but also others that are successively larger. In 2001, a physicist from San Francisco's Exploratorium reproduced Whitehead's experiment by creating eight dominoes out of plywood, each of which was 50% larger than the one before. The first was a mere two inches, the last almost three feet tall. The resulting domino fall began with a gentle tick and quickly ended with a loud slam. Imagine what would happen if this kept going. If a regular domino fall is a linear progression, whiteheads would be described as a geometric progression. The result could defy the imagination. The tenth domino would be almost as tall as NFL quarterback Peyton Manning. By the eighteenth, you're looking at a domino that would rival the Leaning Tower of Pisa. The 23rd domino would tower over the Eiffel Tower. And the 31st domino would loom over Mount Everest by almost 3,000 feet. Number 57 would practically bridge the distance between the Earth and the Moon. For a visual representation of this progression, check out Figure 2, which can be viewed on our website at theonething.com. A geometric progression is like a long, long train. It starts out too slow to notice until it's moving too fast to stop. Getting Extraordinary Results So when you think about success, shoot for the moon. The moon is reachable if you prioritize everything and put all of your energy into accomplishing the most important thing. Getting extraordinary results is all about creating a domino effect in your life. Toppling dominoes is pretty straightforward. You line them up and tip over the first one. In the real world, though, it's a bit more complicated. The challenge is that life doesn't line everything up for us and say, here's where you should start. Highly successful people know this. So every day they line up their priorities anew, find the lead domino, and whack away at it until it falls. Why does this approach work? Because extraordinary success is sequential, not simultaneous. What starts out linear becomes geometric. You do the right thing, and then you do the next right thing. Over time it adds up, and the geometric potential of success is unleashed. The domino effect applies to the big picture, like your work or your business, and it applies to the smallest moment in each day when you're trying to decide what to do next. Success builds on success, and as this happens over and over, you move toward the highest success possible. When you see someone who has a lot of knowledge, they learned it over time. When you see someone who has a lot of skills, they develop them over time. When you see someone who has done a lot, they accomplished it over time. When you see someone who has a lot of money, they earned it over time. The key is over time. Success is built sequentially. It's one thing at a time. Chapter 3. Success Leaves Clues Ogmandino said, It is those who concentrate on but one thing at a time who advance in this world. Proof of the one thing is everywhere. Look closely and you'll always find it. One product, one service. Extraordinarily successful companies always have one product or service they're most known for or that makes them the most money. Colonel Sanders started KFC with a single secret chicken recipe. The Adolph Coors Company grew 1500% from 1947 to 1967 with only one product made in a single brewery. Microprocessors generate the vast majority of Intel's net revenue. And Starbucks? I think you know. The list of businesses that have achieved extraordinary results through the power of the one thing is endless. Sometimes what is made or delivered is also what is sold, sometimes not. Take Google. Their one thing is search, which makes selling advertising its key source of revenue possible. And what about Star Wars? Is the one thing movies or merchandise? If you guessed merchandise, you'd be right. And 
you'd be wrong. Revenue from toys recently totaled over $10 billion, while combined worldwide box office revenue for the six main films totaled less than half that, $4.3 billion. From where I sit, movies are the one thing because they make the toys and products possible. The answer isn't always clear, but that doesn't make finding it any less important. Technological innovations, cultural shifts, and competitive forces will often dictate that a business is one thing evolve or transform. The most successful companies know this and are always asking, what's our one thing? Apple is a study in creating an environment where an extraordinary one thing can exist while transitioning to another extraordinary one thing. From 1998 to 2012, Apple's one thing moved from Macs to iMacs to iTunes to iPods to iPhones with the iPad already jockeying for the pole position at the head of the product line. As each new golden gadget entered the limelight, the other products weren't discontinued or relegated to the discount tables. Those lines plus others continued to be refined while the current one thing created a well-documented halo effect making the user more likely to adopt the whole Apple product family. If everyone has the same number of hours in a day, why do some people seem to get so much more done than others? How do they do more, achieve more, earn more, and have more? If time is the currency of achievement, then why are some able to cash in their allotment for more chips than others? The answer is, they make getting to the heart of things the heart of their approach. They go small. When you want the absolute best chance to succeed at anything you want, your approach should always be the same. Go small. Going small is ignoring all the things you could do and doing what you should do. It's recognizing that not all things matter equally and finding the things that matter most. It's a tighter way to connect what you do with what you want. It's realizing that extraordinary results are directly determined by how narrow you can make your focus. The way to get the most out of your work and your life is to go as small as possible. Most people think just the opposite. They think big success is time-consuming and complicated. As a result, their calendars and to-do lists become overloaded and overwhelming. Success starts to feel out of reach, so they settle for less. Unaware that big success comes when we do a few things well, they get lost trying to do too much, and in the end accomplish too little. Over time, they lower their expectations, abandon their dreams, and allow their life to get small. This is the wrong thing to make small. You have only so much time and energy, so when you spread yourself out, you end up spread thin. You want your achievements to add up, but that actually takes subtraction, not addition. You need to be doing fewer things for more effect instead of doing more things with side effects. The problem with trying to do too much is that even if it works, Adding more to your work and your life without cutting anything brings a lot of bad with it. Missed deadlines, disappointing results, high stress, long hours, lost sleep, poor diet, no exercise, and missed moments with family and friends. All in the name of going after something that is easier to get than you might imagine. Going small is a simple approach to extraordinary results, and it works. It works all the time, anywhere, and on anything. Why? Because it has only one purpose. To ultimately get you to the point. When you go as small as possible, you'll be staring at one thing. And that's the point. Equality is a worthy ideal pursued in the name of justice and human rights. In the real world of results, however, things are never equal. No matter how teachers grade, two students are not equal. No matter how fair officials try to be, contests are not equal. No matter how talented people are, no two are ever equal. 
A dime equals 10 cents, and people must absolutely be treated fairly. But in the world of achievement, everything doesn't matter equally. Equality is a lie. Understanding this is the basis of all great decisions. So how do you decide? When you have a lot to get done in the day, how do you decide what to do first? As kids, we mostly did things we needed to do when it was time to do them. It's breakfast time, it's time to go to school, time to do homework, time to do chores, bath time, bedtime. Then, as we got older, we were given a measure of discretion. You can go out and play as long as you get your homework done before dinner. Later, as we became adults, everything became discretionary. It all became our choice. And when our lives are defined by our choices, the all-important question becomes, how do we make good ones? Bob Hawk said, The things which are most important don't always scream the loudest. Complicating matters, the older we get, it seems there is more and more piled on that we believe simply must get done. Overbooked, overextended, and overcommitted. In the weeds, overwhelmingly becomes our collective condition. That's when the battle for the right of way gets fierce and frantic. Lacking a clear formula for making decisions, we get reactive and fall back on familiar, comfortable ways to decide what to do. As a result, we haphazardly select approaches that undermine our success. Pinballing through our day like a confused character in a B-horror movie, we end up running up the stairs instead of out the front door. The best decision gets traded for any decision, and what should be progress simply becomes a trap. When everything feels urgent and important, everything seems equal. We become active and busy, but this doesn't actually move us any closer to success. Activity is often unrelated to productivity, and busyness really takes care of business. As Henry David Thoreau said, it's not enough to be busy, so are the ants. The question is, what are we busy about? Knocking out a hundred tasks, for whatever the reason, is a poor substitute for doing even one task that's meaningful. Not everything matters equally, and success isn't a game won by whoever does the most. Yet that is exactly how most play it on a daily basis. Much to do about nothing. To-do lists are a staple of the time management and success industry. With our wants and others' wishes flying at us right and left, we impulsively jot them down on scraps of paper in moments of clarity, or build them methodically on printed notepads. Time planners reserve valuable space for daily, weekly, and monthly task lists. Apps abound for taking to-dos mobile, and software programs code them right into their menus. It seems that everywhere we turn, we're encouraged to make lists. And though lists are invaluable, they have a dark side. While to-dos serve as a useful collection of our best intentions, they also tyrannize us with trivial, unimportant stuff that we feel obligated to get done because it's on our list. Which is why most of us have a love-hate relationship with our to-dos. If allowed, they set our priorities the same way an inbox can dictate our day. Most inboxes overflow with unimportant emails masquerading as priorities. Tackling these tasks in the order we receive them is behaving as if the squeaky wheel immediately deserves the grease. But as Australian Prime Minister Bob Hawke duly noted, the things which are most important don't always scream the loudest. Achievers operate differently. They have an eye for the essential. They pause just long enough to decide what matters and then allow what matters to drive their day. Achievers do sooner what others plan to do later and defer, perhaps indefinitely, what others do sooner. The difference isn't in intent, but in right of way. Achievers always work from a clear sense of priority. Left in its raw state as a simple inventory, a to-do list can easily lead you astray. 
A to-do list is simply the things you think you need to do. The first thing on your list is just the first thing you thought of. To-do lists inherently lack the intent of success. In fact, most to-do lists are actually just survival lists. Getting you through your day and your life, but not making each day a stepping stone for the next so that you sequentially build a successful life. Long hours spent checking off a to-do list and ending the day with a full trash can and a clean desk are not virtuous and have nothing to do with success. Instead of a to-do list, you need a success list, a list that is purposely created around extraordinary results. To-do lists tend to be long. Success lists are short. One pulls you in all directions. The other aims you in a specific direction. One is a disorganized directory and the other is an organized directive. If a list isn't built around success, then that's not where it takes you. If your to-do list contains everything, then it's probably taking you everywhere but where you really want to go. So how does a successful person turn a to-do list into a success list? With so many things you could do, how do you decide what matters most at any given moment on any given day? Just follow Urine's lead. Urine cracks the code. In the late 30s, a group of managers at General Motors made an intriguing discovery that opened the door for an amazing breakthrough. One of their card readers, an input device for early computers, started producing gibberish. While investigating the faulty machine, they stumbled on a way to encode secret messages. This was a big deal at the time. Since Germany's infamous Enigma coding machines first appeared in World War I, both code making and code breaking were the stuff of high national security and even higher public curiosity. The GM managers quickly became convinced that their accidental cipher was unbreakable. One man, a visiting Western electric consultant, disagreed. He took up the code-breaking challenge, worked into the night, and cracked the code by 3 o'clock the following morning. His name was Joseph M. Uren. Uren later cited this incident as the starting point for cracking an even bigger code and making one of his greatest contributions to science and business. As a result of his deciphering success, a GM executive invited him to review research on management compensation that followed a formula described by a little-known Italian economist, Vilfredo Pareto. In the 19th century, Pareto had written a mathematical model for income distribution in Italy that stated that 80% of the land was owned by 20% of the people. Wealth was not evenly distributed. In fact, according to Pareto, it was actually concentrated in a highly predictable way. I was shocked and let him know I thought it would take a lot more than that. He said, no, Jesus needed 12, but you'll need 14. It was a transformational moment. I had never considered how so few could change so much. What became obvious is that as focused as I thought I was, I wasn't focused enough. Finding 14 people was clearly the most important thing I could do. So, based on this meeting, I made a huge decision. I fired myself. I stepped down as CEO and made finding those 14 people my singular focus. This time the earth really did move. Within three years, we began a period of sustained growth that averaged 40% year over year for almost a decade. We grew from a regional player to an international contender. Extraordinary success showed up and we never looked back. As success begat success, something else happened along the way. The language of the one thing emerged. Having found the 14, I began working with our top people individually to build their careers and businesses. Out of habit, I would end our coaching calls with a recap of the handful of things they were agreeing to accomplish before our next session. Unfortunately, many would get most of them done, but not necessarily what mattered most. Results suffered. Frustration followed. So in an effort to help them succeed, I started shortening my list. 
If you can just do three things this week, if you can do just two things this week, finally, out of desperation, I went as small as I could possibly go and asked, what's the one thing you can do this week such that by doing it, everything else would be easier or unnecessary? And the most awesome thing happened. Results went through the roof. After these experiences, I looked back at my successes and failures and discovered an interesting pattern. Where I'd had huge success, I had narrowed my concentration to one thing. And where my success varied, my focus had as well. And the light came on. This happened as the result of one letter they sent to one person, Ed Roberts, who changed their lives forever by giving them a shot at writing the code for one computer, the Altair 8800, and they needed only one shot. Microsoft began its life to do one thing, develop and sell basic interpreters for the Altair 8800, which eventually made Bill Gates the richest man in the world for 15 straight years. When he retired from Microsoft, Bill chose one person to replace him as CEO, Steve Ballmer, whom he met in college. By the way, Steve was Microsoft's 30th employee, but the first business manager hired by Bill. And the story doesn't end there. Bill and Melinda Gates decided to put their wealth to work, making a difference in the world. Guided by the belief that every life has equal value, they formed one foundation to do one thing, to tackle really tough problems like health and education. Since its inception, the majority of the foundation's grants have gone to one area, Bill and Melinda's Global Health Program. This ambitious program's one goal is to harness advances in science and technology to save lives in poor countries. To do this, they eventually settled on one thing, stamp out infectious disease as a major cause of death in their lifetime. At some point in their journey, they made a decision to focus on one thing that would do this, vaccines. Bill explained the decision by saying, we had to choose what the most impactful thing to give would be. The magic tool of health intervention is vaccines, because they can be made inexpensively. A singular line of questioning led them down this one path when Melinda asked, where's the place you can have the biggest impact with the money? Bill and Melinda Gates are living proof of the power of the one thing. One thing. The doors to the world have been flung wide open and the view that's available is staggering. Through technology and innovation, opportunities abound and possibilities seem endless. As inspiring as this can be, it can be equally overwhelming. The unintended consequence of abundance is that we're bombarded with more information and choices in a day than our ancestors received in a lifetime. Harried and hurried, a nagging sense that we attempt too much and accomplish too little haunts our days. We sense intuitively that the path to more is through less. But the question is, where to begin? From all that life has to offer, how do you choose? How do you make the best decisions possible? Experience life at an extraordinary level and never look back. Live the one thing. But Curly knew, all successful people know, the one thing sits at the heart of success and is the starting point for achieving extraordinary results. Based on research and real life experience, it's a big idea about success wrapped in a disarmingly simple package. Explaining it is easy. Buying into it can be tough. So before we can have a frank heart-to-heart -heart discussion about how the one thing actually works, I want to openly discuss the myths and misinformation that keep us from accepting it. They are the lies of success. Once we banish these from our minds, we can take up the one thing with an open mind and a clear path. Part 1 The Lies. They mislead and derail us. Mark Twain said, it ain't what you don't know that gets you into trouble. 
it's what you know for sure that just ain't so. The Trouble with Truthiness In 2003, Merriam-Webster began analyzing searches on their online dictionary to determine the word of the year. The idea was that since online searches for words reveal whatever is on our collective minds, then the most searched for word should capture the spirit of the times. The debut winner delivered. On the heels of the invasion of Iraq, it seemed everyone wanted to know what democracy really meant. The next year, blog, a little made-up word that described a new way to communicate, topped the list. After all the political scandals of 2005, integrity earned top honors. Then, in 2006, Merriam-Webster added a new twist. Site visitors could nominate candidates and subsequently vote on the word of the year. You could say it was an effort to instill a quantitative exercise with qualitative feedback. Or you could just call it good marketing. The winner by a 5 to 1 landslide was truthiness, a word comedian Stephen Colbert coined on the debut episode of his Comedy Central show as truth that comes from the gut, not books. In an information age driven by round-the-clock news, ranting talk radio, and editor-less blogging, truthiness captures all the incidental, accidental, and even intentional falsehoods that sound just truthy enough for us to accept as true. The problem is we tend to act on what we believe, even when what we believe isn't anything we should. As a result, buying into the one thing becomes difficult because we've unfortunately bought into too many others. And more often than not, those other things muddle our thinking, misguide our actions, and sidetrack our success. Life is too short to chase unicorns. It's too precious to rely on a rabbit's foot. The real solutions we seek are almost always hiding in plain sight. Unfortunately, they've usually been obscured by an unbelievable amount of bunk an astounding flood of common sense that turns out to be nonsense. Ever hear your boss evoke the frog in boiling water metaphor? That is, if you toss a frog into a pot of hot water, it will jump right back out. But if you place a frog in lukewarm water and slowly raise the temperature, it will boil to death. It's a lie. A very truthy lie, but a lie nonetheless. Anyone ever tell you that fish stink from the head down? Not true just a fish tail that actually turns out to be fishy. Ever hear about how the explorer Cortez burned his ships on arriving at the Americas to motivate his men? Not true. Another lie. Bet on the jockey, not the horse, has long been a rallying cry for placing your faith in a company's leadership. However, as a betting strategy, this maxim will put you on the fast track to the pauper's house, which makes you wonder how it ever became a maxim at all. Over time, myths and mistruths get thrown around so often, they eventually feel familiar and start to sound like the truth. Then we start basing important decisions on them. The challenge we all face when forming our success strategies is that, just like tales of frogs, fish, explorers, and jockeys, success has its own lies too. Phrases like, I just have too much that has to be done. I'll get more done by doing things at the same time. I need to be a more disciplined person. I should be able to do what I want, whenever I want. I need more balance in my life, and maybe I shouldn't dream so big. Repeat these thoughts often enough, and they become the six lies about success that keep us from living the one thing. The Six Lies Between You and Success Lie 1. Everything matters equally. Lie 2. Is multitasking. Lie 3. A disciplined life. Lie 4. Is willpower is always on will call. Lie 5. Is a balanced life. And lie 6. Big is bad. The six lies are beliefs that get into our heads and become operational principles driving us the wrong way. Highways that end as bunny trails. Fool's gold that diverts us from the mother load. If we're going to maximize our potential, 
We're going to have to make sure we put these lies to bed. On June 7, 1991, the Earth moved for 112 minutes. Not really, but it felt that way. I was watching the hit comedy City Slickers, and the audience's laughter rattled and rocked the theater. Considered one of the funniest movies of all time, it also sprinkled in unexpected doses of wisdom and insight. In one memorable scene, Curly, the gritty cowboy played by the late Jack Palance, and city slicker Mitch, played by Billy Crystal, leave the group to search for stray cattle. Although they had clashed for most of the movie, riding along together, they finally connect over a conversation about life. Suddenly, Curly reins his horse to a stop and turns in the saddle to face Mitch. He says, Do you know what the secret of life is? Mitch answers, No, what? Curly responds, This, and holds up one finger. Your finger? asks Mitch. Curly says, One thing, just one thing. You stick to that, and everything else don't mean shit. That's great, says Mitch. But what's the one thing? Curly replies, That's what you've got to figure out. Out of the mouth of a fictional character to our ears comes the secret of success. Whether the writers knew it or unwittingly stumbled on it, what they wrote was the absolute truth. The one thing is the best approach to getting what you want. I didn't really get this until much later. I'd experienced success in the past, but it wasn't until I hit a wall that I began to connect my results with my approach. In less than a decade, we'd built a successful company with national and international ambitions. But all of a sudden, things weren't working out. For all the dedication and hard work, my life was in turmoil, and it felt as if everything was crumbling around me. I was failing. Something had to give. At the end of a short rope that looked eerily like a noose, I sought help and found it in the form of a coach. I walked him through my situation and talked through the challenges I faced, both personal and professional. We revisited my goals and the trajectory I wanted for my life, and with a full grasp of the issues, he set out in search of answers. His research was thorough. When we got back together, he had my organizational chart, essentially a bird's eye view of the entire company, up on the wall. Our discussion started with a simple question. Do you know what you need to do to turn things around? I hadn't a clue. He said there was only one thing I needed to do. He had identified 14 positions that needed new faces. And he believed that with the right individuals in those key spots, the company, my job, and my life would see a radical change for the better. But we're fooling ourselves. Multitasking is a scam. Poet laureate Billy Collins summed it up well when he said, We call it multitasking, which makes it sound like an ability to do lots and lots of things at the same time. A Buddhist would call this monkey mind. We think we're mastering multitasking, but we're just driving ourselves bananas. Juggling is an illusion. We come by it naturally. With an average of 4,000 thoughts a day flying in and flying out of our heads, it's easy to see why we try to multitask. If a change in thought every 14 seconds is an invitation to change direction, then it's rather obvious we are continually tempted to try to do too much at once. While doing one thing, we're only seconds away from thinking of something else we could do. Moreover, History suggests that our continued existence may have required that human beings evolve to be able to oversee multiple tasks at the same time. Our ancestors wouldn't have lasted long if they couldn't scan for predators while gathering berries, tanning hides, or just idling by the fire after a hard day of hunting. The pull to juggle more than one task at a time is not only at the core of how we're wired, but was most likely a necessity for survival. But juggling isn't multitasking. Juggling is an illusion. 
To the casual observer, a juggler is juggling three balls at once. In reality, the balls are being independently caught and thrown in rapid succession. Catch, toss, catch, toss, catch, toss. One ball at a time. It's what researchers refer to as task switching. When you switch from one task to another, voluntarily or not, two things happen. The first is nearly instantaneous. You decide to switch. The second is less predictable. You have to activate the rules for whatever you're about to do. Online at theonething.com, Figure 6 illustrates the differences between an interrupted workflow and a focused workflow, showing that multitasking doesn't save time, but rather wastes time. Switching between two simple tasks, like watching television and folding clothes, is quick and relatively painless. However, if you're working on a spreadsheet and a coworker pops into your office to discuss a business problem, the relative complexity of those tasks makes it impossible to easily jump back and forth. It always takes some time to start a new task and restart the one you quit, and there's no guarantee that you'll ever pick up exactly where you left off.